Freedom Day. My name is Rosie Smiler. My grandfather, Fintan Lingari, was an Australian hero, the greatest hero this country has ever seen. People sing songs about my grandfather, about what he and my people, Gurindji, people achieved for Australia. I want to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. His footsteps started with our ancestors long ago. Let me tell you about the pathway they made for us from, the, from then to now. My grandfather and I, we are Gurindji people and we have been connected to the lands and waters southwest of Catherine for tens of thousands of years before 1879. My ancestors lived a life of peace and abundance. Our laws and social system were the most advanced in, in the world. In our law, the land, plants and animals are part of us. We all have our place. But in 1879, a Gardia white person named Nat Buchanan rode his horse into Gurindji land. To my people in them days who had never seen a Gardia or a horse before the Mount Gardia looked like something from another world. Buchanan acted friendly, but little did we know his eyes were hungry, seeing a place to make lots of money. And he found it in the wonderful grassy plains that were, were our home. Five years later, Buchanan came back, accompanied by his family and thousands of hungry cattle the government in Adelaide had granted Buchanan our land to build a cattle station. Even though no one in Adelaide had seen or met us Gurindji people, politicians made this decision under the law, not ours, without us as if we never existed. As Buchanan moved on to Gurindji land, life became very difficult for my people. The cattle trampled and chewed through the best grassland, our sacred sites, our meeting place, hunting grounds and waterways were fenced off. Our food supplies became scarce. They called themselves settlers, but to my people they were invaders. The Gardia believed Aboriginal people to be less than human because we were black and because of the difference in our language, laws and ways of living with the land, our culture. It suits the invaders to think this way because believing we were not human, it was easier for them to do cruel things and take our land. If we took a cow to eat, Families were ambushed and killed as punishment. We, we can still see bones from these massacres, like the skulls at Blackfellow Knobs. Aboriginal people were treated like this all over Australia, where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were once 100% of the population. Now we are merely 3%. In those Hardest time, our men were captured and enslaved to build the first stock stockyard. They worked with heavy chains around their necks. Soon, most of our men, women, and children worked for the Gardia. What choice did my people have? We lost our land, our, our access to tra tra traditional food supplies, and our waterways. Everything was taken from us our ways of living was broken. When a very rich British man, Lord Vesti, brought the lease from the beginning family, life didn't get any easier. The Aboriginal workers did 16 hours days of back-breaking labor. The men taking care of the cattle, mining, maintaining fence, bores and equipment, the women cooking, the children running errands and 
finding the guardians, the elders hustling the swag from the guardian house, cleaning, washing, ironing. Aboriginal workers were only paid in meagre rations, a bit of flour, beef bones, tea and tobacco. There was no shade or materials to build a comfortable shelter. The water supply was distant, so we were forced to carry water pails on our shoulders so family could drink and wash. To shelter from hot winds in the day and cold winds at night, Gurindji built windbreaks from stone. You can still see them today. With all the work, there was barely any time for ceremony, relationships, social activities or caring for our land. All the things that were important to us. The station manager wouldn't even give my people time off, time off work for funerals. Aboriginal people in them days, not really that long ago, my grandfather's time, were not really workers. We were not free, we were slaves. This has been a sad story so far. It still makes me cry sometimes. But it's important we know that we know the truth. How do you feel about it? How would you feel being treated like this? Now the next part of the story is about hope. I want to tell you so you know what to do with those feelings you have inside. And I want to remember remember it because it is very important to all of us. Vincent Lingari, my grandfather, was a leader. He told the Kadia that they need to treat Aboriginal workers with more respect. But every time he tried to get the Kadia to pay his people properly and let us live a happy life, they wouldn't do it, even when sometimes they promised they would. That's when we decided sometime soon we would walk off the cattle station in protest. We wanted to live on our land, our way. When my grandfather broke his leg yoking a donkey, he was sent to a hospital in Darwin. When he was there, he met a friendly Kadia who worked on the wharf, Brian Manning, and two Aboriginal men, Dexter Daniels and Tudor Wally. They were from the union. A union is a group of workers who want to help other workers. They promised to help us if we decided to walk off on strike. We found a mate. When my grandfather got back to Wavehill Station, he told the station manager that Aboriginal people wouldn't work for nothing anymore. He said they would walk off. He was so brave. The station manager begged them to stay, saying he would double their pay. Vincent said, I'm sorry, but you couldn't have thought of that in the first place when we'd been in the job. On the 23rd of August, 1966, more than 200 courageous Aboriginal people walked off Wavehill Station following my grandfather. They were men, women, Karo, children, and old people from the Walpuri, Mutpura, Ngarinman, Bilinara, and Gurindji, First Nation, walking together. As they walked west, the morning sun was at, at their back. Long shadows were cast before them. I imagine my old people were frightened to be standing up to the Gadia. Their shadows reminded them of family lost in the massacre time, but they were brave. 16 kilometres they walked, carrying their babies and everything they owned towards the only place that wasn't owned by Lord Vesti on Gurindji country, a place called Libanunku. Halfway there, the Karu were struggling. The sun was so hot, it made them tired, thirsty and hungry. They tried digging for waters at a dry creek bed, Janani, and found none. Over the horizon, a Monaku policeman came galloping on a horse. The Monaku was known among my people for being harsh towards Aboriginal people. He tried to scare my grandfather into taking my people back to work, but Vincent Lingari would not be intimidated. He was dignified and determined. He kept walking and the people followed. When they reached Libinango, they stopped and camped. Gardia Stockman, the government and British Lord Festi tried to make us go back, but after eight years of being treated like slaves at Webel Station, Aboriginal people were demanded to fight for equal rights and help our land. But where were our mates from the unions? Fenson was worried the promised help would not come. After two long weeks of waiting, there was great commemoration of fringes of the camp. Gardia coming, Gardia coming. 
the young people were calling out, worried about an attack. But then they saw it was De Dexter Danielson. He was the Tiruali blind no, man, and he was with Tiruali blind Manning and a friendly young Gadia boy named Kerry Gibbs. They had driven from down in a green bedfoot truck full of supplies. Help at last, my grandfather always really calm, said to the union men. It's, so, it's good to see you. We've been waiting for you, fellas. For nine long years, my people continued their protests. With the help of our union friends, my grandfather and other Gurindji leaders traveled to the big city of lights. They talked to many Gadia people who also became our mates. Eventually, one of our mates became the prime minister. His name was Gough Whitlam, and he promised to give our land back. On 16 August 1975, my grandfather stood with the Prime Minister at Dagaragu, the community Gurindji people built while we protested. The Gadia leader of all Australians picked up a precious handful of our land, lent in towards Vincent Langari, the leader of Gurindji, and poured the sand back into our hands. We had won our land back and could now live on our land our way. I am proud of my grandfather's legacy. The Gurindji leaders of today are Continuing the leg that legacy, we are building a strong, vibrant community. But now let me tell you about some unfinished business. We have our land, but we still need to have a voice. We won some land back, but sadly, despite everything we tried, we weren't able to live on our land how we wanted to after all. The politicians wanted Gurindji to live the Gadi away, but Gurindji just wanted to look after our families raise our own cattle and practice our culture on our land without being told what to do. By the late 1980s, years of bad advice and Kadia taking advantage of us had taken its toll. Some politicians were helpful, but most never listened to Gurindji leaders. They made decisions in Parliament that harmed us. Many of our young people started to lose hope. In 1988, my grandfather died. That's why in 2017 we wrote the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We want to have a Gurindji voice coming together with all other First Nations. A power, powerful voice so Gadia can hear us. Our voice can tell Australia the truth. Our voice can help make treaties. Our voice should be in the rule book as it should have been long ago. The Uluru Statement is an invitation to all Australian people to walk with us like our mates walked with us Gurindji before. A mixture of courage, determination and helpful mates like you is how my grandfather got a hand full of sand. Now will you walk with us again?